finance professional in a disrupted business landscape, what does it take to be in demand? What does it take to attract great paying international roles? If you're an ICANN member, it'll just take one exam. That's all it takes to complete the globally recognized SEMA professional qualification and the internationally in respected CGMA designation. As a SEMA member and a CGMA designation holder, employers will look at you as a finance professional, constantly acquiring new skills to add value to the business. That's why they'll be willing to pay premium to hire and retain you. If you have five years of relevant experience and are an ICANN member, you can directly sit for the final exam of the SEMA professional qualification, the strategic case study exam. Start studying the SEMA professional qualification. Prepare to make an impact. Good evening, professional colleagues. Good evening, friends of the Institute of Chartered Accountants of Nigeria. Our students, ladies and gentlemen, we want to welcome you to another episode of ICANN on Air. This day, Tuesday, the 25th day of the month of October in the year 2022. I want to sincerely appreciate all our viewers who have been part of this program, learning, on learning, and on skilling their ideas day by day with the topical uh, topic and season facilitator that have been doing justice to our topic. We appreciate you, and we know that you've been the preacher of the gospel to make sure that others are brought on the net. Today, I've come with a topic on risk management very fundamental and to do justice to this is no other person than mr victor onyepa fca who is a partner in tax regulatory and uh, uh in, in in tax regulatory and people service practice of the kpmg in nigeria it was until recently the chief exec operating officer of KPMG in Nigeria and doubled as the risk management partner for several years. Uh, before assuming uh, those positions, he was the partner uh, and head of tax, regulatory, and people services practice and served as the head of energy and natural resources line of the business for Nigerian Fed. He has 32 years' experience in providing tax, regulatory, advisory, compliance services across various sectors of the Nigeria economy, but particular focus on ENR sector. He left uh, the firm as a partner to join Shell Group in 2002. He served as a lead advice, tax advisory to the commercial team for Shell Expo uh, in UK. Uh, he was a tax manager overseeing tax affair for Shell Company in Nigeria. Thereafter, he was the business manager, a uh, business finance manager before joining the firm in 2006. Uh, a first class uh, bachelor's degree in chemistry from the University of Benin, an alumnus of the Lagos Business School, and has attended several management training programs, both local and offshore, including other business school. Uh, Victor is a fellow of the Institute of Chartered Accountant of Nigeria, your institute, and also uh, a fellow of Chartered Institute of Taxation of Nigeria, as well as an associate member of the Chartered Institute of Taxation, United Kingdom. Sincerely speaking, our guest is well loaded, very vast, ready to impact knowledge into us. The only thing you'll be doing me this evening is to try, check through. If your friend does not uh, connect to this program, quickly dial the number asking that I can on air is live and we are ready to impact the knowledge. Let me quickly go on a very short commercial break. 
knowing fully well that this platform is out there to promote your goods and service services. As I come back, I'll come in with the guests and we'll hit the ground running. Stay tuned. I'll be right back. Welcome back, and it is my great pleasure to welcome our guest for today, Mr. Victor Oyemba, FCA. Mr. Victor Oyemba, good evening, and welcome to ICANN on Air. Good evening, Shesson, and thanks for having me. Great pleasure to have you. We will be doing justice to risk management, considering your wealth of experience in this particular field. Let me start this way by asking, Risk management is a phrase whose relevant cut across all facets of human endeavor. We would like to start with the basics so that the global audience will be able to have the opportunity of learning and sharing from your word of experience based on the CV I just read. Let me start with this by asking, sir, what is risk? Thank you, sir. Um, let me paint a scenario. Your friend has invited you for an event in Ibadan, and you have to drive from Lagos to Ibadan. Of course, on the way going to Ibadan, you're going to see bombs, you're going to see um, potholes, you're going to see, you know, curves, you know, you're going to see real craters. You have to navigate through all of that to be able to get to a battle, to attend your friend's show. So risk, um, in very simple language, are those bumps, those portals, those craters, those twists and turns on the way as you go from Lagos to a battle. Mm. So if I bring that back to the business world, you can describe a risk as anything that can stop a business from achieving its full potential. And in fact, some risks can potentially kill a business. Hmm. That is a very simplified way. Even for someone that did not visit a school, you should be able to pee bumps on the road. Very simple way to define a risk. Well, let me proceed further. Considering your experience, sir, can you run us through the types of risk uh, that are out there in the business world? Sure, so there are so many types of risks that are out there. And to a very large extent, the ones that will have relevance will depend on the particular industry or sector that you're mm -hmm. operating. So um, if I take our profession, the accounting profession, you'll agree that the risks that we face in that profession will be different from what, for instance, somebody in oil and gas, you know, will consider his or her uh, top risks. They staying, um, you know, close home, the kinds of risks you're going to have with, you know, risks like talent risk, especially with what's happening now with young people leaving Nigeria and going to work and live abroad. So talent risk for our business is a major risk right now. The Japa the syndrome. The Japa syndrome, thank you very much. The risk of quality, 
that the quality of work that you do, you know, meets your client's expectation is a very important risk. You have financial risk. You have risks around information protection. You have cyber risk, you know, risk of somebody, um, you know, hijacking as you were your IT system and being able to do harm to the business through that. You have liquidity risks. And of course, you have risks like um, regulatory risks. And you have risks like health, safety, and the environment, etc. So the world of risk is really a very broad and wide one. Hmm. Very broad and very wide one is a function of the segment or the sector that you belong to. And uh, I think I'm just hearing the first one you mentioned, maybe because of uh, uh, that is the trending thing now, the talent risk uh, all through my time. Uh, I, I've never come back, but I've, I'm act, adding that to my vocabulary. Various type of risk, but has to do with the one that is peculiar to your sector. Let me take this that, uh, is there any relationship uh, between risk and security based on your experience? I think you have to see them as they have the two ends of a spectrum. Um, okay. Obviously, if you are if you are unaware of the risks that surround what you do as an individual, as a business, you would you will feel yourself to be very secure, right? Mm. So um, security is at one one end of it, and risk as it will be at the, at the other end of it. So the the better you manage your risks, the more secure you will be as an individual or a business. So that is how I would like to relate um, risk and security. They are in a sense, you know, the two ends of the spectrum. Mm. The, you know, the more risks um, that challenge you in your business or as an individual, the less secure you are. And then the better you manage those risks, the more secure you can also become in you know, as a business, especially. Mm. So risk and security, uh, the uh, better you're able to manage this risk, uh, the better your security. And uh, if you let your guards down, uh, then you are prone to uh, something unplanned for. Uh, yeah. Let me say that our viewers are connected globally. I can see people from your state, from the uh, from uh, Lagos here, from the east, from the west. Uh, I've seen from Akoko, I've seen from Gombe. Uh, you are all welcome. And uh, I'm on with uh, Mr. Victor Oyemba, uh, who is doing justice to risk uh, management. So I encourage you to bring in your questions so that we can treat them as we proceed uh, in the question. Mr. Oyempa, I want to uh, go this way. Uh, in spiritualism, uh, they will say sin is sin, meaning that there is nothing like big sin and there is nothing like small sin. Uh, what we call take it to risk, uh, is there anything like a big risk or small risk or risk is simply risk, just like they would tell us in the spiritualism that sin is sin. Well, luckily for us, there is something like a big risk mm -hmm. and small risk. So um, it's it's not um, a question of all risks being the same. Okay. And if you look at how how you, in a sense, dimension a, a risk, um, it could be one that you consider to be a remote a remote um, kind of risk. In fact, I, I'm, I'm looking at the likelihood of the risk occurring, and there are two parameters that we use uh, in um, evaluating risk. The first parameter is the impact the risk will have on you or on the business if it was to happen. And the second would be the likelihood of that particular risk materializing. And so if I stay with the likelihood of a risk materializing, um, it can be remote. With, in which case you consider the likelihood of it as very, very remote, very, very low. It could be low, it could be medium, and it could be high. And similarly, in terms of the impact the risk will have on your business, it could be a very low risk, and it could be, um, sorry, it could be a very low impact, and it could be a risk that will be catastrophic to your business. So a risk that is, in terms of impact, low, and in terms of likelihood of occurrence also low, you can ignore it. Mm. But a risk that the impact is catastrophic 
and it's likely to, to occur is a risk that should keep a business awake at night. So yes, there's a difference between a very high risk and a low risk in the risk world. So there are differences. Uh, it's not like the spiritualism that uh, we're trying to make comparison with. So no, there no, is no, big risk is, and there is, is small risk. Yeah, this is very practical, not spiritual at all, Sesha. <laughs> it's not spiritual, very practical about it. And uh, as we proceed, let me encourage again that our viewers who are connected all the way from uh, Abuja, Benin, Makodi, Akoko, Enugu, Kene, Ibadan, Lagos, uh, even from the diaspora uh, are out there to bring Tobias their questions that you will be able to do justice to. Uh, as we coast further, uh, let me ask, uh, based on the topic, uh, what is risk management? And uh, is risk management the same as risk control? Okay, uh, let me start with the second question, uh, which is whether risk management and risk control are the same. And the answer is no. Risk control is a subset of risk management. Okay. Having said that, let's then answer the question, what is risk management? In very simple terms, risk management is a practice that seeks to first identify, secondly, evaluate, third, track, and fourth, mitigate against identified risks. So the first aspect of risk management is identifying the risks, then evaluating them or assessing them, tracking them, and then putting mitigating steps in place to enable you, in a sense, to carry on as a business without those, those risks bringing you down as a business. Hmm. So the highlight of risk management speaks to identifying the risk, evaluating the risk, tracking the risk, and definitely puts some measure to mitigate the risk. Very simple way to digest uh, risk management. And I think from your word you said, the risk control is not the same with risk management, but a subset of uh, uh, risk management. I await the question of our viewers uh, as we do justice to risk management with Mr. Victor Oyempa, uh, FCA, who has been treating uh, this topic the way it should be. Uh, let me proceed further, sir. Uh, why, why is risk management important? Uh, what are the principles? involved you know risk management is uh, important because um it enables you to in a sense remove those things that can actually bring an organization to its knees in fact um if i quote um the one time ceo of goldman sachs a gentleman called um cone he said if you don't have risk management in place as a business it doesn't matter what business you are in it's a risky business hmm. so risk management is, a, is you know you know are those steps they're going to take as a business to ensure that your business is able to 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 run as planned and to achieve its strategies its objectives etc you must be able to have that uh, fundamental. Uh, I, I, I'm proceeding uh, with this after having uh, known the importance of uh, risk management. Uh, can you tell us the principle that is involved uh, in uh, in uh, risk management? Okay, so um, like like I mentioned, you have to go through those steps of um, identifying the risk because if you don't know the risk you can manage it right so being able to identify all the risks that are likely to affect your business is a very critical first step the second obviously is to analyze the risk because like i pointed out um, there are some risks that their impact on the business would be not significant and then there are those that the impact can be catastrophic. So you need to be able to evaluate all the evaluate. risks and be able to say, here are the big ones 
that we really need to focus our attention on. And that, that is the next step, which is prioritizing the risks. So after you've identified all the risks, you've analyzed all of them, you then prioritize. So you're going to have your top risks and you're going to have the other risks. And clearly from a resource allocation point of view, what you want to do is to put as much of your resource as possible in dealing with those your priority risks. The fourth, the fourth step is then treatment. Having identified the risk, what are you going to do to make sure that that risk doesn't materialize? If it materializes, the impact on your business will not be significant. That's how you, you treat the identified risks. And of course, you have to continue to monitor because, you know, first of all, you, you, know, you want to make sure that the, the treatment you're giving the risk is actually yielding the right results. So you have to monitor to see how those treatments is actually impacting the risk. And in fact, if I quote um, a one-time German Army general, you know, who said that um, um, every plan, every every war plan, you know, that if I, he said, if I quote him correctly, no, no war plan survives contact with the enemy. Hmm. So if I bring that to the world of risk, um, you, after having defined the treatment, the moment that treatment comes in contact with the reality of the risk itself, you might find that you have to tweak it. And the way you design that treatment initially might not be sufficient to address the, the that particular risk. So you have to treat it and, and tweak it. And you can do that because you're monitoring to see how the treatment is, is uh, you, know, it, you know, is addressing that particular risk. And beyond that also, the monitoring is important because um, you might have certain set of risks today and there could be new ones tomorrow. So if you don't monitor continuously, you may not be able to identify when new risks, you know, that affect your business have come into play. And by the way, the risks can be either internal or external. So you monitor internally as well as externally. I don't know how many of us will remember um, several years ago when, um, you know, NLNG was shut down by NIMASA from being able to, you know, being able to, to transport cargo out of Nigeria to meet its um, potential obligation. You know, NLP, you know um, NLNG was monitoring its internal risks, you know, diligently. They had no idea that the government regulator could shut it down, you know. So that's why it's important that as much as you pay attention to the internal risks, you must also keep your eyes out there to know what's happening externally and what impact those external factors can have on your business and making sure that you have steps to help you mitigate the impact of the external risks. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. Oyemba. Uh, he, he is as if I'm in class, receiving that lecture, preparing for exam. We're just taking it one after the other. Larry uh, actually asked a question, uh, one of our viewers, and uh, he's asking that, uh, what risk are we uh, associating with uh, Nigeria borrowing funds and not minding uh, the future generation? Uh, what risk, which risk can we identify that to? Okay, if I were to try to put it into my set of risks, I mean, there are several risks that will come with that particular action. The first, obviously, is liquidity risk. You know, the risk that you, at the time you need to pay back these, these funds, you don't have the resources to do so. And if you can't pay the risk, there are issues around default, et cetera. And those issues will then have, you know, knock-on effects. Because if you if you if you don't meet the, uh, the obligations as and when they become due, they become a credit risk, and that will have, you know impact investors coming to your country to make investments and potentially will have long term effects on your economy. So really, the risk of borrowing money and not being diligent in terms of how you're going to be able to repair the money um, when 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 they afford you for repayment, you know, is is multifaceted and it's a risk. That we should actually pay a lot of attention to as a country mm. is a risk that we should pay serious attention to because it's multifaceted uh in level uh pa permit me to take you back uh maybe you know i mentioned the other time that uh, you just mentioned one risk that i'm hearing on i can on and that is the major reason 
why we bring this uh, question, uh, this program uh, together. Uh, you, you mentioned something like a talent risk. And uh, given that this appears to be a major risk facing this country currently and the Nigerian enterprise on itself, uh, can you give an opinion on what an organization or organizations uh, should do to mitigate the menace of this risk? I mean, the talent risk. Sure, so if I had the answer to that question, I'd be a millionaire. <laughs> <laughs> uh, maybe I'm trying to make you work this evening, sir. <laughs> but let me, you know, first, I think it's important that we properly understand the implications of that risk. And I would like to explain that using our profession as an example. So accounting firms, right? What, what we are finding is that people qualify, they become chartered, and almost the very next day, you know, they are emigrating to Canada, to the UK, to the US, and to all other parts of the world. In fact, recently, a friend of mine came to me and said, um, we're well, not a friend, um, um, a mentee, I mean, he's a friend, you know, came to me and said, he has an, you know, he has an offer. I said, okay, where at this time is it, um, you know, is it, is it Canada or UK? He said, no, it's, no, he said, no, it's Poland. I said, Poland too? <laughs> Poland to I'm going to no, Poland, but it's real, you know. And mm. I think um, the the risks that we run with that is one, we don't have the resources in terms of experience and and qualification to do the work. The second is I don't have that resource in in the right quantity. And as a business, as as accountants, if I if I may stay with you know who we are, you then run the risk. Of not being able to serve your clients properly mm. because if you go and do an audit um, work for instance i haven't got the right skills on the audit chances are going to make errors on the audit and then you know you can imagine what would then happen to you as a firm if they then find out that the quality of the audit that you are providing to you know to clients is very poor if i run the risk of being of a lesson being withdrawn mm. so it's a major risk Solution, um, unfortunately, it's one of those risks that the, the driver is, is beyond all of us in terms of, um, you know, part of the reason why our young people are leaving to go abroad is because of, um, you know, the macro issues. Um, they think that their circumstances will be better served if they were in the UK, for instance, and if they, and if they were to remain in Nigeria. Um, so it's macro. Um, unless the macroeconomic environment changes, we may not be able to reverse that and that trend. But having said that, you can't fold your hands and say, "I can't do anything about this risk. So I'm just going to lie down and die." So you have to you have to do things. What kind of things? One of the things that we have done as a, you know you know in as a as, as, as a firm in Nigeria is in recruiting heavily at the bottom. Yeah. Maybe you used to recruit just 10 people in a year. This is time to look at bringing in 20, you know, maybe 25, maybe 30. The idea here, you know, being that if you have 30 and, uh, and 10 of them leave, you probably still got 20 sometime in the future. Whereas if you, if you have 10 and the whole 10 leave, you have nobody in the place. So you have to over recruit at the bottom. And not just in one year, but you know, every year, you know, you actually need ten people at the bottom, but you bring in twenty because they are thinking of the future. So that's 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 one way, um, you know, firms are looking to address the issue. The second way, because these guys are recruiting today, they still have to be trained, and uh, it, it takes some time to to come up to speed in terms of quality and experience. They have a need today because some people have left you today. To go to Canada, and you have clients that have, have to serve today. Mm. Now, how that's been handled, I have to tell you, Sheson, is that people are just going to other firms and trying to bring people in, and mm. um, um, and you know you're, you're bringing that is happening from a shrinking pool of resources mm. because people have left. They've also left that other firm, and they are going there to say, um, out of the two that are left there, um, let me take like, one. Yeah, can I take one? In fact, can I take the two of them if, if it's possible? <laughs> and 
the way it's being done also poses a risk because sometimes mm -hmm. you go to somebody who is maybe a three-year a three-year um, accountant and you say to him i want you to join me and his answer is why should i join you as a three-year accountant you know that's what i that, that's what i'm here as anyway so you have to bring me across as a five-year experienced accountant and pay me the money <laughs> but he or she hasn't got the skills to be able to operate that level. Mm. Because you yeah, are desperate, it's okay, come on, you know, come as a five year um, expense accountant. So that in itself is also it's a, a risk. risk. Mm. You know, but again, um, one of the things that you know, we're looking to do is um, to look at people who are abroad because, you know, sometimes when you haven't gone abroad, you think once you get there, all your problems are solved. You know, so you, you want to be repatriating them. When they come out of Heathrow, yeah, there'll be money to pick on the streets. <laughs> when you have been there for a couple of years, you realize that actually maybe I'm better off in Nigeria than I am in the UK. Mm. So also reaching out to, to people, you know, like that and saying, um, might it be interested in coming back, you know, having 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 gone there, seen, you know, seen it, done that. Um, and then, you know, being able to interest them. Again, it comes down to what are you offering them in return. But being able to interest them to, you know, to, you know, to consider returning back to Nigeria. Of course, um, the, the, the other way which most firms have to begin to think about now and to do so seriously is to say, you know, maybe maybe the way the world is going, I don't need all my resource to be based in Nigeria. Um, so maybe they want to live in Canada, but is it possible for me to get them to work for me from Canada? Because from Canada. all I really want them to do is to provide the resource. And as, as, as we found out through um, the lockdown that um, COVID-19 occasion, what can be done from anywhere? Mm. And I think that's that's an area that is beginning to get more and more attention. Of course, there are risks to be considered as usual. As I said, there's a risk of, um, you know, for instance, if, if if your staff is working from Canada, um, the personal tax obligations, you know, who is responsible for it? Is it you based in Nigeria or is it him, you know, you know who is you know, over there in Canada? So all those sorts of things have to be taken into account and consideration. But Since that, that is beginning to look at like a very viable option in terms of being able to meet the resource gap that is happening as a consequence of the of the Japa syndrome. Hmm. You just said that uh, the question is to provide uh, 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 to make you a billionaire. I can tell you for free that uh, I think after doing justice to that question, uh, you are not just a billionaire. I'm, talk I'm seeing you as a, a trillionaire that will. We'll hand over the budget of the country to very soon so that we can come to you to borrow. Very excellent delivery, Mr. Oyepa. Uh, let me take uh, Jimo Olamileko's uh, question. He's been on screen and uh, he's appreciating, you know, this insightful discussion on risk management. But he's asking that uh, can you shed more light uh, on the, the two tools of uh, risk management? That is a uh, loss in incidents reporting lir and uh, risk and control self-assessment lc as a as effective tool in risk management well so those are those are um if you like the the steps we, you, you have to take um as a professional um if, if i if i if i just stay with the incident reporting um if what are the things because the, the thing about our institute, our, inst our profession, as you know, as an example, is that we are regulated. So, if you fall foul of some of the requirements, you know, you're supposed to keep to. There are consequences, and if you look at how regulators have operated, um, especially um, you know, globally, especially in more advanced countries, um, if if you do self self reporting. They look at you more leniently and they tend to believe you more when you say oh, it was a control failure. We have now identified the control and we're taking steps to fix it compared to where, um, you know, something happens, you try to hide it, they then find it out themselves. And they not only find that this has happened, they also find, you know, find out that actually you've taken steps to try to hide it. Um, they tend to come real hard on you. I, I don't know if any of us saw the uh, recent story about the chief um, security officer of, of uh, OBA, who they eventually um, 
was convicted of trying to 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 cover up um, um, malfeasance that took place, um, you know, within Uber, and then um, beyond the company, you know, being sanctioned, he, as an individual, you know, was found guilty and they received a penalty as an individual. So that's that's how big that's how big uh, you know regulators take the issue of um, you know self-reporting, and um, you know whether companies come forward when they discover that things haven't you know haven't worked properly, versus you know trying to hide things and then they the regulators having to find those things out. So um, you know it, you know the you know it's it's real. The issues are real, and that's also why it's very important that every company has the right risk management structure in place. And that you don't, and, and by the way, and I'm hoping we'll come to a point where I will, I will, I will take us through um, how you determine the, you know, the kind of risks to focus on um, as an organization. You know, um, you know, the, you know what we typically call the, the the risk heat map, how how that is developed, and then you know that that helps you then know where to put all the effort in. But the point is, you know, um, risk is so so crucial now to every business, risk management, that is. And if you don't have the right structures in place to manage those risks, including reporting those risks. So for instance, um, you have policies to say, this is how we're going to do things in our organization. But if you don't have whistleblowing, you know, you know, structure in place to say, if anybody is not following our policies, here are the steps to take to report it. If you don't have that in place, then you haven't quite finished, you know, the work you need to do around your risk management processes. Very wonderful submission, and I want to believe that uh, our viewer has uh, seriously benefited from that uh, explanation. Uh, I want to appreciate everybody, and uh, let your question keeps coming in. But before I go to uh, Oluba and uh, question, I, I have this question for you, sir. Uh, I remember in financial management, we often associate risk with returns. Uh, in project evaluation. Uh, can you please, using your knowledge and your, your risk management expertise, uh, speak to this phenomenon? Okay, well, um, what, what, what that uh, typically means, and that's also a very important point I would, I would I'll be making in a moment around this whole question of risk management. Um, you know, what that means is that the, the more the risk you take, the more the, the reward you expect to get from the risk. Um, as a simple example, um, if if there's a bank that is overflowing with you know with investment, you know everybody has has their money in the bank, and the bank is then able to to, to give out this money as um, as loans to customers, etc. I go to the bank and say, I want to deposit my money, you know, in your bank. They probably offer you bottom rates because they don't need their money they have more than enough for their own to do stuff with on the other hand as another bank um that you know customers are asking for for loan from and they haven't got resources to do that loan that bank is likely to offer you um a bigger interest rate to have you put your you know, put your money with them than the other bank that is you know well well resourced but of course um if one or two or three of the of the loans of the where resource bank was to go bad, it's okay. You know, it has sufficient base to be able to you know cover you know, cover that loss and still return money to those that are invested in it, compared to this other bank that um, you know paid this higher you know, this higher amounts to you know to get the loan. So the risk is higher that you might lose your money with this bank that's paying you a higher interest rate. And you know, if you know what you are doing, you should actually be asking for you know really more you know in a higher interest rate from that kind of bank than from the more solid bank. Um, but bringing that back to um, the world of risk, so what I, I just did here was from the from the classical risk and reward you know you know you know and consideration. But you know, when we say risk management, I think it's important that we understand that the idea here is not that. You can run a business without any risk. That's not possible. The world is such that you know you run risks, you know, naturally. You know, coming to work every day is a risk that you might be knocked over by a car. Um, 
or if you are driving a car and that car can just run into you and push I you run into you and I'm pushing to the lagoon, you know, not just running into you. So, <laughs> so, so it's important to first understand what the risk is, and then to say a number of things. Can I mitigate this risk? Because if you can't, you shouldn't take that risk on. Mm. Can I mitigate it? And the answer is yes. To say, well, okay, I can mitigate it. However, I'm taking a risk doing this thing. I have to be paid for it. So, being able to charge the appropriate price. For the risk you're taking right if you don't have a process of determining that this is a riskier project than the other one okay. you probably just go there and, and charge the same amount of money mm. not knowing that whereas you can do this job end the money and go home and sleep properly the other one could potentially expose you to a risk that you have to end up paying four times what you got as professional fees and engagements so it's important that you properly understand properly dimension the risk of every project you are going to get into and properly price that risk into your, you know, your fees as a profession. Because if you're taking a risk, you should be rewarded for it. Mm. Very wonderful submission. Uh, and I have Dr. Abel say all the way from uh, Abuja uh, asking this question that uh, as accountant, we are very futuristic. As we look forward to 2023, what should we be telling our clients an employer who are skeptical uh, about investing more funds in Nigeria today and even tomorrow? Well, I think it comes down to the risk appetite of the individual. Um, um, like, like you read out when you were going through my, my, my CV, my industry, the industry I specialize in is the energy and natural resources industry. And I remember several years ago when the PIB was just, you know, the petroleum industry bill was looking like a trend that had left the station and was lost somewhere, somewhere on the, you know, on the way. And many, many operators in the sector were reluctant to invest. The particular operator, you know, took, you know, took a, you know, an FID, you know, uh, you know, invested in, a, in, a, you know, in, in developing a new, field in Nigeria and then today is reaping the rewards of that investment mm. and the reason like, you know clearly the reasons if I may you know one obviously um that that company had a bigger risk appetite than the others who said we're not going to do anything we're just going to wait until this whole matter is sorted you sorted out but beyond that is also they've done they did their homework and realized hang on a minute you know we've we've gone through these sorts of things in Nigeria before and ultimately, you know, we'll come out okay. Therefore, even though it looks all dark just now, uh, we believe that things are going to come out okay. And by the way, the, you know, the petroleum industry that has come out now is much, I believe, is you know, is much better than what people were expecting. From that you know, perspective, if if you have a client who is reluctant to, you know, who is very risk averse, I mean, yeah, clearly. Um, in fact, if you tell him to invest money in Nigeria, he will look at you and say, "You're giving me very bad advice, <laughs> right?" You know, you're not a good professional. You're, very bad advice. you're, not, you're not a professional. You're not a professional, in fact. So you have to understand your client first and foremost, and to say, "Okay, well, yeah, it is what it is." So if you if you want to you know, kind of hold on, with, you know, on further investments, and the things settle down, I mean, you'll be welcome to do it. The other way to then also look at the question, you know, be to say, you know, where are we today? Um, who are the people running for for office in 2023? Do we see a potential that um, no matter which of them, you know, wins, that we see a potential for upside? And based on that, we say, you know, maybe maybe you know, it can't be any worse off in 2023 than you are at this point in time. And if you are here still, then it can't get any worse in 2023, and therefore you can take those bets. Um, but of course, it depends. Like I said, that you know the risk appetite of the of the firm or the individual or the company that that, that, that you are speaking to. Hmm. You must understand your client very well, your employer, and those that you are actually talking to. Uh, do they have the risk appetite, or they are risk adverse? Uh, others to know the kind of uh, advice you give to them as professional. Uh, sincerely speaking. Uh, we've been having it good with our guest uh, today. 
I'm going to combine uh, the question of Fadbola uh, with that which I have here. Uh, who is uh, asking what are the risk averting mechanism to guide against crippling the economy of Nigeria with excessive borrowing for sustainability? And uh, I want to combine it with this, my question, uh, saying that you are a risk guru. Uh, there are practical risks uh, that is confronting the nation as we speak. Uh, how do we manage it uh, from your professional view or control it? Uh, I would say eliminate, but I know that risk, risk cannot be eliminated because eliminating the risk is risk on its own. How do you do justice to this question, sir? I'm going to try. Um, <laughs> I think that's a very that's a very tough question. Um, so I'm going to just try, and I believe that if we were to go around, you know, the you know the room of audience and uh, and ask people to, to give you their their views, I'm going to have I'm going to have as many views as people that are listening in on this program. Um, so I, in my view, we have to start with leadership because that really drives a lot of of what can happen. Um, if you have a leader who understands what the issues are and then um, can then bring professionals to help him design the solution and um, i think i think that'd be the first step we need to take as a country you know, have to get the right and the, uh, the leadership right the the second is that we have to understand that given where we are as a country we're going to have to take real hard tough decisions to you know to move forward and um, the world at this point in time maybe things will change in the future but the western world who by the way and those that are giving us most of the of the debt that we have now, they are not they are not interested in debt forgiveness. <laughs> I know African countries are asking, and you know it's okay to ask, um, but the their body posture does not suggest that they are willing to to do any debt forgiveness. Forgive. At, at best, maybe you go and borrow from IMF, and then use to use to to you know to to pay down some of your other foreign you know foreign debts. But I don't. Not a lot of those people are, are discussing debt forgiveness, and especially when they look at you and some of the you know the policies you are, you have as a country, and they think you guys are not serious about solving your problem, and, you know, then they tend to be even less inclined to to do debt forgiveness. And so we also we as a people also have to understand that to come out of where we are, there will be tough moments ahead, and we must you know we must be willing to go through you know those uh, tough moments. I was pleased listening to one of the, you know, the uh, you know, one of the um, you know, presidential candidates speaking the other day, and he said, you know, my job is not to make you guys happy. My job is to make sure that we do the right thing that will help us solve our problems. Hmm. You know, if, if you want to make us happy, you are going to keep subsidy, for instance, hmm. and um, you know, yeah, we would buy petrol for free almost, um, but <laughs> somebody has to pay for it, and so we we'll go and borrow money to. To pay for for the for, you know for the subsidy, and this money we could have used to do our roads, so that you know I said at the beginning that you know when you drive to it, but you are going to see potholes and stuff. Okay. But if I use that money to do the roads, um, it would have been a smoother road. It would have had less risk to deal with driving from Lagos to Ibada. So everything has a price, you know, mm. because you know, mm. our money money is finite, right? So if you spend mm. it, you know, the more you spend in a particular area, the less you have to spend in another area. So what's important to us as a country? We have to define it. And even if you are borrowing, to then borrow money and put the, and put that money in the right places, not just them, you know, make people happy. Hmm. Leadership is very fundamental. And when you go borrowing, borrow and uh, make sure that those uh, funds are channeled to the right uh, place. Let me take an uh, earnest uh, question which is uh, very germane to we professional accountant. He said in these times of uh, internet of things, uh, some software are already doing the work of uh, accountant in most organizations, at least the basic one, like we've heard on this program from uh, some of our guests. He's asking what is the risk for the future and prospective accountant in the light of digitalization of machine work? There's a book I recommend that he read. Um, okay. It's a book titled The Future of the Professions. It's written by a father and son. I think their name is Richard and David Soskin. Um, 
you know, but just Google the book. It's called The Future of the Professions. And what that book essentially says is that um, in the in the future, AI as artificial intelligence will take over the professions. And uh, so, so bear in mind that up to this point in time, there has been this belief by we professionals that, oh, professional services are very personal. You know, accounting, for instance, is very personal. Law is very personal. Medicine is very personal. That, you know, um, you need an individual, you need a human to do it. And but what that book was saying to us is that um, that's, not, that's not true, actually. Because all that will happen is that if you put sufficient information into the, into the machine, into the artificial intelligence, it will have much more experience, as it were, than any individual. As an example, you know, assume um, um, you, are, you are a doctor treating patients, right? And um, patients have come to you and they said, um, you know, I woke up in the morning and my left eye was just blinking, you know, uncontrollably. And you said, okay, go and take aspirin, just one aspirin. And the first patient took it, and the eye stopped blinking. So Hura aspirin, aspirin has solved the problem. Second patient comes and says, the other day, you know, I woke up in the morning, my left eye was blinking uncontrollably, and I, I and just can't stop. And he said, take, take an aspirin. The patient takes aspirin, the eye starts blinking. So for you, you are now experienced in curing people that have that wake up in the morning and their left eye is blinking uncontrollably. So you are good. 90 patients come to you with the same complaint. Solution works. The 91st patient walks in, same complaint. You recommend that spring. It doesn't cure it. Mm. But that experience is out the window. Because you've never had to deal with someone who had that symptom, but did not react to the treatment. So that you have treated 90, 90 patients that you have cured successfully become irrelevant. But a machine would know that, yeah, aspirin cured a million people of this treatment, but there were five out of the million that he did not cure. He mm. knows it already. So the moment you come and it doesn't cure you, aspirin knows what else to do. When you're the doctor who is experienced, you know, in today's world, you are lost at that point in time. Mm. So the truth of the matter is that indeed our professions are, are at risk. All these mm. professions, you know, accounting, law, law medicine, medicine, et cetera, they are at risk. Mm. And I will encourage all of us to actually read this book I just spoke about now. I think this, um, you know, this, they are, they are, the father and son are obviously, but they are, they are, they are British. Um, and I, I, I found that book extremely revealing. Um, mm. And the good thing, so the good thing, if I may, is that um, I don't see it happening anytime soon. So we are, we are safe. <laughs> <laughs> At least that yeah. that have had the risk uh, in a very minimal uh, uh, way, uh, yes. Mr. Victor. But, but, but going forward, if I may, uh, it's just. But going forward, I think we have to be very, very conscious of the fact that the way we provide services today, as accounting professionals will be very different from how it's going to be done in 10 years from now, as an example. That, 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 that is very much correct, sir. Uh, time is not always our friend, uh, because I can see from the feelers of our uh, audience, our viewers, there are questions. But uh, in one minute, I want to take this question because it's related to our institute, and I will not leave. I will not allow you to go until you do justice to this. And that will be our closing shot. Uh, you know, ICANN is always open to ideas that will positively advance the growth uh, of our members, the accounting profession, and the Nigerian business environment. Uh, what would be your general advice or suggestion uh, to the Institute and our members regarding further supporting uh, Nigerian investors uh, and government in area of risk management, mitigation, and control? Uh, you help me do justice to that in a minute. Uh, yes, um, I think I think as professionals in the in the in this in the industry, um, we have to be emphasizing to the companies that we work for uh, the importance of risk management. I did give us a quote um, about uh, you know a business being risky. If 
if um, it doesn't have a risk management system in place. Um, it has to be at the company level, but also at the national level, we have to have a risk management mindset. Um, again, that, you know, that's another quote I like to you know, refer us to if we have time, and it's by a guy called Lee Ayakoka. Um, he was very involved in uh, Ford Motors. If, so if you're interested, just, just look him up. Um, and what he says, you know, with, you know, with respect to um, well, a decision, but I'm bringing it now to the decision around risk. He says, even a correct decision is wrong if it's taken too late. Mm. So beyond, beyond um, you know, focusing on risk management, we should also take mitigating steps at the right time. That is a, that is that is correct at the company level. It's also correct at the national level. And as mm. professionals, we the accountants will be pushing that and making sure that in whatever we are doing as companies and as a nation, that we're actually dimensioning all the risks that could potentially come out of that and making sure that we have mitigations in place to address and mitigate those risks. Sincerely speaking, that is a very brilliant way to bring the show to an end today and uh our guest mr victor Yimpa, uh fca as advice our viewers today which is another take off to go check out the book the future of the profession uh by the daddy and son uh from the britain thank you very much for sharing your evening with us on icon on here mr victor uh Oyimpa. we sincerely appreciate and we believe when next you we call you'll definitely uh yield the time to do justice and educate our members uh on that note uh we'll be rounding up the program but let me quickly share with us few announcements that is coming from our institute let us encourage ourselves that uh, the world congress of accountants is holding next month in mumbai india from november uh 18 to 21st uh november 2022 you and I understand the strategic role that I can place in IFAC our body. The topic of discussion is uh, enabling, it's talking about sustainability. So I want to encourage us that we hook on to our website, check those details that we have there, contact the people in, uh, in, 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 in on, on, on the chat, do the necessary thing that is expected. Is a time for you to network, a time for you to enrich your knowledge globally and uh, will definitely be on for it. Let me also state that uh, the fellowship confirmation, uh, the portal is open. We can, uh, those of us that are due can start enrolling for the fellowship confirmation. And in no distance time too, we should be having our induction. On this note, I'm rounding up the program to connect with you again uh, on Thursday with another brilliant uh, topic and another scintillating uh guest that will do justice to it on that note i remain your host for today olusha son okwadi fca till thursday bye for now <laughs>